FIJA, the Fully Informed Jury Association. And uh, Kirsten Tynan is the executive director. Uh, they are headquartered in uh, Montana. It's a nonprofit educational organization dedicated to informing the, the public about their rights and responsibilities as jurors in delivering just verdicts. Through outreach programs, research, publications, and media, FIJA educates jurors about traditional legal authority to conscientiously acquit through jury nullification and about the impact of various changes to the jury system on its role in protecting individual rights. So I introduce to you Kirsten Tynan, Executive Director of FIJA. Good morning, and thank you everyone for attending. Uh, like, like she said, I'm Kirsten Tyne. I appreciate the perfect pronunciation of my name. <laughs> uh, it is I before R. You might have seen it R before I somewhere, so I just want to make sure that's clear. Um, this is really my first time in Texas as an adult, and we've spent the last few days traveling around doing a number of different events. Uh, basically between Montana and here, and uh, this has been uh, a really, I, I caught a little bit of Mary's talk earlier today and the talk next door, and it was great to hear kind of the, the tone of the event and everything. Uh, it sounds very welcoming, not just of libertarians, but sort of opening the door to um, how libertarians can cooperate with non-libertarians and kind of pull them closer into the fold. And so that is one of the uh, things I'll be talking about today. Um, you may have seen this talk billed as uh, liberty and civic duty. And so I wanna clarify first a little bit about what I will talk about and what I'm not gonna talk about. Um, this is not a talk about voting or campaigning. It's not a talk about registering for the draft or anything like that. This is specifically about your rights and responsibilities as a juror. I also want to reframe it a little bit. It may surprise some people to find out that I do not consider jury duty a duty. <laughs> I don't believe that anyone has the right to force us or coerce us to sit in judgment of another human being, to attend court proceedings, etc. But that doesn't mean I'm not all for serving as a juror. I am very much in favor of it, and I would like to reframe it as not a civic duty, but a civic opportunity. Many times as libertarians, we have sort of a knee-jerk reaction that when we are told we have to do something, we immediately want to get out of it. <laughs> um, and in terms of who is really excited about jury duty, I would say it's not just libertarians who have a knee-jerk reaction saying, I don't want to do that. It's pretty much everyone. You mention jury duty and people want to run the, look, they just, these people came in the room, I said jury duty, and they just left. <laughs> so, <laughs> So I think if we, if we reframe it in terms of a civic opportunity instead of a civic duty, uh, that is really going to um, be more uh, encouraging uh, people participate. Now, why would we want to participate in jury duty? We're gonna get paid peanuts, if anything. We'll probably spend that all on the parking garage because we're not gonna get any sort of parking uh, uh, consideration. Uh, we're going to be herded around like cattle. We're going to sit in a, the most uncomfortable room of the courthouse. We're, we may not even get called to be a juror. And when we do, we're going to be asked all kinds of invasive questions. So why would we ever want to do that? <laughs> well, there is a secret that we are not told uh, before or inside the courtroom by any courthouse official. And that is that by going through this process, we have the opportunity to save another person's life. And I think most of us, if we were, let's say we're, we're vacationing out at the lake somewhere, 
and we see a person drowning, we're not going to be thinking, oh, I'm going to get my clothes wet. Oh, that looks so far. I'm going to have to run down there. You know, my, I might get messy. I don't want to save that person's life. It's very inconvenient. <laughs> we're probably thinking, oh my gosh, let's go pull this person out of the water. And that is how I think of this opportunity of jury, uh, jury service. Um, and so what are we specifically talking about? The term you'll typically hear thrown about is jury nullification. And that has certain connotations. It sounds kind of like you're against something. It sounds like you're zeroing something out. And those are kind of the reasons why it's used. But I have heard an alternative term that I prefer, and that is conscientious acquittal. Um, that incorporates two different aspects of the same concept. The concept of voting not guilty uh, and protecting someone from government abuse. And it also incorporates the concept of doing so based on our conscience. Now, typically when you go into the courtroom, say you're selected as a juror, you will most often be told that, or it will be strongly implied to you in such a way that you would probably assume you're required to convict if you believe that the law has been broken and the prosecutor has made the case that it has been broken beyond a reasonable doubt. That is simply not true. Uh, there are various reasons why it is uh, essentially judges are given a blank check to lie to the jurors and uh, prosecutors are basically allowed to screen them out. Um, but that's how it is. If you don't go into the courtroom knowing that you have the right to vote not guilty for any reason that you believe is just, you're not going to find out from anyone inside. So that is why the Fully Informed Jury Association exists. We feel that government is never going to be properly incentivized to help people not enforce government's laws. The incentive of government will always be to enforce its own laws, keep itself in power, and convict and incarcerate. So it's up to an independent um, group of people uh, FIJA activists and everyone interested in jury nullification to independently educate ourselves and educate others about this power that is typically kept secret from them. So I'll kind of go through some of the basics of jury nullification or conscientious acquittal for anyone who's not yet familiar with it. And then we'll, since we have a libertarian crowd here, we'll kind of step it up to jury nullification, or jury rights 201, because I think probably some of you are already a little bit familiar with it. So just a basic um, what it is, you have the right to vote not guilty for any reason you choose, and when the entire jury votes not guilty, even though the case has been made that the law has been broken, that is, in its strictest sense, what jury nullification is. In a broader sense, it also includes when one or a few jurors vote not guilty and a verdict cannot be delivered. That is a hung jury and it results in a mistrial. That's not it, as full a jury nullification as the previous uh, stricter definition I gave because when there is a mistrial, the defendant can be retried. Now that said, it's not guaranteed that they'll be retried. Maybe they'll get a better plea bargain offered to them Maybe the prosecutor is embarrassed enough by the loss that they, they will stop altogether. Uh, judges can say, in the interest of justice, I'm not going to allow the prosecutor to re-prosecute. Or if it does go to trial again, the defendant may at least be in a better position, knowing what the prosecution's playbook is, to defend themselves. So that's the second sense. A third sense was sort of um, dubbed Jury Nullification 2.0 by Professor Paul Butler. Um, he cited a case from our home state, Montana, in which a jury could not even be seated. This was a case where a defendant was accused of one count of possession of one sixteenth of an ounce of marijuana in a city that had passed an ordinance by Citizens Initiative to tell the police to make marijuana enforcement their lowest priority. 
they call in a pool of uh, potential jurors and start questioning them. Would you convict this person if it's proven that he had this amount of pot? The responses were amazing. I was so proud. It was, why are we here? I should be at work and be productive. Why are we wasting our taxpayer dollars on this? Are you kidding? <laughs> they could not get enough people to agree to blindly enforce this law against this defendant to even seat a jury. And after well over half of the potential jury pool was screened out because they would refuse to do this, the judge realized, A, we're running out of potential jurors, and B, even if we could get 12 people together, that would not be a representative cross-section of this community. <laughs> and so he basically told the attorneys to maybe revisit a possible deal, and the defendant ended up with what is known as an Alford plea, in which he did not even have to admit guilt, and the quote-unquote punishment was basically, stay out of trouble for six months and we'll forget this ever happened. And so, in that sense, uh, Professor Paul Butler calls that jury nullification 2.0. Um, and then there's a special situation uh, in capital cases. Capital cases are death penalty cases, and they are prosecuted against people who have committed heinous crimes that we as libertarians would all agree are actual violations of the non-aggression principle. So what does jury nullification have to do with this? Is anyone going to run out and let a murderer off? All right, we, we saved him. <laughs> That's really not what it's about. In capital cases, however, there is a second phase that the jury participates in that they typically don't participate in uh, in most states. And I can't re recall, Texas may be one of the few states where jurors in non-capital cases actually participate in sentencing. But in every state and in the federal courts, uh, jurors are the final authority as far as deciding whether the defendant will be sentenced to life without parole or get the death penalty. And so what we've actually seen increasingly is, you know, as we see that we are able to contain these people and that a disturbing percentage of death penalty verdicts are later found to be mistaken, we're seeing jurors who are simply not willing to impose the death penalty. Um, they understand that if this person is truly a danger to society, they can be successfully contained by imprisonment. And if they are not, if this is one of the mistaken cases, we have actually committed an aggression against them that is irreversible if we sentence and, and carry out an execution. So that is the phase in which um, uh, uh, jury nullification kind of comes into play in uh, death penalty cases. And then there's one more form of jury nullification I'd like to talk about that is, uh, I have a semi-local example. I'm just going to take a quick sip of water here before I start that. I believe this case was last year in New Braunfels, Texas. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, there was a tragic situation in a high school in which uh, one student was, um, he testified that he had been bullied repeatedly by a group of students. He had, this had taken place under the watchful gaze of his teacher who didn't solve the problem. The problem was brought to the attention of school administration who did not deal with it. And finally, the young man told the people who were tormenting him, they were actually physically assaulting him according to his testimony. He told them that if they didn't stop, he was going to start taking action himself. He would hit back. And apparently the behavior stopped by all the, the kind of the instigator um, of this bullying. And uh, something took place in his classroom after he had given this warning. And after class, he left the classroom, stood outside, waited for the person. And when the person came out, he punched him in the face. The uh, 
person's head then hit the wall and he suffered uh, a great amount of trauma and died. So this case ended up with the prosecution wanting to get a murder or manslaughter conviction against this young man. Uh, then there was a series of argument <laughs> over uh, another possible charge. Uh, the defense argued and the judge agreed to include what is a, known as a lesser included charge in which uh, it's a, sort of a subset of the higher charge. Um, so that lesser included charge in this case was simple assault. Uh, simple assault does not involve a death, but it does involve a physical aggression. In between simple assault and manslaughter, neither side wanted to include in the jury instructions an instruction about felony assault. So that would have been more serious than simple assault, but not as serious as manslaughter. But that was not included in the jury instructions. Uh, so this ended up going to the jury after some appeals and argumentation over whether or not this simple assault charge could be included because in this case, with a death occurring, strictly speaking, that is not an accurate charge. Um, it ended up going to the jury, and they did not convict him of murder or manslaughter, but did convict him of simple assault. And so technically, that is a jury nullification, because they acquitted him of these higher charges, which would have actually, probably manslaughter would have been the accurate charge. But they probably thought, you know, this is a young person who he tried to deal with it in other ways before this tragedy happened. He wasn't getting support from the adults he had gone to. He had warned the person ahead of time, and he hadn't actually intended to kill him. He just wanted to send a message that he was not going to be a doormat anymore. And you know, he was awfully he was he was also very uh, regretful. He was. You know, it's, it's, it's a traumatic thing when you do that to someone, especially when you're not intending to do it. So they probably thought, you know, what kind of punishment is appropriate here? Is it, is this someone whose life needs to be taken away from him essentially for the next couple of decades? Or is there something less than that that would deal with this while still, you know, acknowledging that there are special circumstances here? So when you convict on a lesser charge, even though that's not strictly appropriate, that's another form of jury nullification. So why would you want to nullify? Uh, I have kind of a, a flow chart that we're gonna turn into a handout um, that I think kind of covers the main reasons you might want, well, you might want to vote not guilty. The first one isn't even nullification. You should and uh, I think you will be told in the jury instructions that you must acquit if you believe the prosecution has not made its case beyond a reasonable doubt. That is the standard. The defense has no uh, obligation to prove that they're innocent. The burden of proof lies strictly on the prosecution. But let's say that has been done. There is not only one defendant on trial here, but there are two. That other defendant is the law itself. Uh, so is the law constitutional? If the answer is no, I would suggest that you should acquit. Maybe the law is, you think it's constitutional, but it's still unjust. Or perhaps it's unjustly applied in this particular case at hand. Again, you should vote not guilty. What if this is generally a good law, but for some strange reason, the penalty is drastically out of proportion to the seriousness of the offense. Um, circumstances in which you might see this, um, if, you, if you have mandatory minimums for particular crimes, often you'll see uh, a drug crime uh, will be considered, you'll get, they'll use a, a, an accusation that you had a gun to kind of bump up the seriousness of that. Uh, because when you have use a gun in the commission of a crime in a lot of jurisdictions, that triggers a mandatory minimum. You might have a situation where a person has committed a third offense that is considered a three strikes and you're out offense. Um, even if that is 
a very minor offense, uh, and we all know there are plenty of contempt of cop type offenses you can be accused of without having actually done anything other than not you know, sufficiently uh, stroke the ego of law enforcement. You know, something very simple could end up with someone uh, looking at 20 years in prison. Um, so those are examples of situations where the penalty could be disproportionately harsh compared to the severity of the offense. Um, and a great example of that that took place last year, also a successful nullification, was in Kansas. There was a fellow by the name of Kyler Carricker who was um, contacted by a former high school buddy. He didn't know him well anymore. The buddy was like looking for some weed. Can you help me get some? Oh, sure, I know a guy. Uh, so he agrees to introduce him to a person he believes will sell him some marijuana. Well, the fellow brings a buddy or two along. I don't remember exactly how many, but uh, now there, there are a couple of people this guy doesn't really know well. Uh, but he introduces him, and upon doing so, learns to his horror that the former high school buddy was not intending to purchase pot, but to take it by force. Uh, he learned this when the buddy shot the pot dealer and also shot him. The pot dealer died. Kyler character lived. And while the actual shooter and the other people, you know, who knew it about and kind of were going along with this plot were all prosecuted, Kyler character was also prosecuted under a ridiculous, uh, a, a ridiculous rule called the felony murder rule which says that if you knowingly participate in a, an offense that is likely to turn violent, then you can be charged and prosecuted the exact same as a murderer if something happens. Now you say, oh, well this is not an inherently violent offense, it's, he's introducing him to a pot dealer. Well, Kansas had specifically amended their laws a couple of times to reel him into this net, uh, saying that Marijuana offenses were, by law, defined as inherently violent offenses, and also that middlemen in pot deals counted as people who could be prosecuted for this. In this particular case, the prosecution filed a motion pre-trial to uh, prevent any discussion of jury nullification, which is more and more common, uh, basically trying to take away any language from the defense attorney to indicate to the jury that they have the power to vote not guilty, even if the law was broken. However, the prosecutor, and I can't quite figure out this lucky uh, thing happened, the prosecutor made the mistake of bringing that up him or herself in court after filing the motion to prevent any discussion of it. And once that happened, now the defense has the right to respond and Kyler's attorney, Sarah Swain, was able to discuss jury nullification with the jury, and they, in fact, uh, convicted him of a minor, like, pot possession type charge, but acquitted him of the felony murder rule, which, per the definition in, in Kansas law, probably he was strictly guilty of. Um, that said, it's obvious, I think, to anyone with a lot of common sense, or even a little bit of common sense, that treating him, who was actually a victim of this shooting and had no intention of, or, or knowledge of it, no intention of participating, no, no knowledge of it, treating him as the aggressor in this case is simply ridiculous. <laughs> so there's an example of, of where you might want to use that. Um, and then the final category, uh, there may be a law that is generally good, but there are some strange circumstances in the particular case at hand that would make enforcing it strictly unjust. Um, so that's kind of the catch-all for, you know, use your common sense and consult your conscience. Uh, depending on the, the case that's before you, you may, there may be some reason other than the ones I've gone through that um, causes you to vote not guilty. Um, and then, Kind of the big thing after those that people need to know and ask very frequently is either is it legal and can I get in trouble for it? <laughs> uh, so there is a uh, 
a little bit of a, of a, a, of a tangled web that answers that. But uh, the general answer is yes, it is legal. No, you cannot get in trouble for it. Now I'll get into a little bit of detail to clarify that. Um, recently, uh, I want to say it was like February 9th this year, uh, Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor was uh, speaking at New York University School of Law and actually commented on jury nullification and basically um, said, yes, the Second Circuit said we need to, you know, judges should stop this whenever they can. But she said she used to agree with that ruling, but has since evolved where she thinks they made a mistake. And she points out that many activists during the civil rights era would be in jail today if they had been convicted of things that they actually did that were illegal. And she also said that uh, she thought that the founders didn't, they did not believe that juries would always get it right, but she thought that the founders thought it was worse for the crown to get it wrong than for juries to get it wrong. And that makes a great point that no one's saying that juries are the end all and we all. We're not saying that they're gonna get it right every time, <laughs> uh, but you're going to err in any system that involves humans, that involves imperfect knowledge, and the jury system is set up to err on the side of liberty rather than erring on the side of government control. So that's, that's my first point on why it's legal. I mean, you've got at least one Supreme Court justice now who has come out in recent weeks basically saying, yes, this is legal. It also, uh, if you look at all of the rulings on jury nullification and how it's talked about in courts, all of the rulings acknowledge that this exists and that jurors cannot be punished for it. What they all say, well, I won't say all of them, but what the general gist is um, of those that try to squash it is jurors can't be punished for their verdict, but if the judge finds out that someone is intending on nullifying, they can actually remove them from the jury, which is not punishment, and replace them with an alternate. Um, and the, uh, the other thing about that is, uh, how would a judge know that a juror is intending to nullify? Well, we get a lot of people who think, you know, everyone loves the movie 12 Angry Men, there's the one good, the, the underdog juror, and somehow he dramatically and heroically converts the other 11. You know, it's very tense and suspenseful and it's, it's dramatic and it's wonderful, but that is not really how it works in real life. <laughs> um, so, Typically, if you're the one holdout juror, I would suggest that you keep your thoughts of nullification to yourself. If you do see any way to express reasonable doubt, express that, vocalize that, because you cannot be removed for having doubts about the defendant being guilty. Um, if you uh, have questions you can ask of your fellow jurors, Please ask those so that you are, in fact, participating in deliberation. Because if you just sit there and say, not guilty, I'm not going to discuss it, you can be removed for refusing to deliberate. Um, and then you kind of have to judge it yourself. But if you have several other jurors who are kind of talking about jury nullification, you might feel more comfortable talking about it. But in general, you are not required to give any reasons why you're voting not guilty. And if just from basic human instinct, you feel the need to sort of provide some verbiage by way of explanation, you can simply say something general like, in my heart, I just can't convict this person. You don't have to say you disagree with the law or anything like that. I actually had one person who, I hope this is over, <laughs> But uh, this one, one person was uh, spreading around on Facebook that jury nullification isn't voting not guilty. You have to like stand up and say, I nullify. That's not it. <laughs> it is just a not guilty vote. Uh, and if you did stand up and say, I nullify, you could probably expect your fellow jurors to report you and you'd probably be removed from the jury. 
leaving that defendant with no fully informed juror to defend them. So what can you get punished for? There are things you can get punished for. Jury nullification is not one of them. You can get punished for lying during voir dire uh, when you're being asked questions and being you know, processed as to whether they'll select you for the jury or not. You can be punished for um, disobeying instructions along the lines of not doing outside research or things like that. Um, but you can't be punished for your conscience or for consulting it. You can't be punished for any vote that you make for any reason. Now, what about some people who have actually been prosecuted for that? One, it is extremely rare. Uh, the only cases I know of are the cases of Laura Creho in Colorado and Carol Asher in Idaho. In both of those cases, um, the side of protection of the juror did prevail, and it has been a fair bit of time since, since any of those cases happened. The Laura Creho case, I believe, was in the 1990s, or at least, I think it was like 1996 to 1998. And I think the Carol Asher case was in the early 2000s. So I think there, there's pretty good understanding from government that they're not going to do themselves any favor by prosecuting those things. Um, that said, they, you, you don't want to leave yourself open to uh, them you know, having a way to say that you disobeyed a no outside research instruction or that you were talking with anyone outside of the jury or that you started talking about the case before deliberations began or things like that. So um, just kind of be mindful of that, but it's a pretty safe thing to do. It happens fairly regularly. It's uh, obviously not the rule. It's definitely an exception to the rule, but every year I see a, a couple of new cases and um, We've started publishing our own calendar um, two years ago where I'm trying to highlight every single case of jury nullification that I can identify. And slowly over time, we're getting them onto the website as well. And so these, it's not just a concept from you know, 1670 England. It's not just a concept from early America. It's something that still happens and is still relevant today in courts. And I think all of us, especially as libertarians, can think of many examples where we would ourselves use it if we had the opportunity. Um, how are we going to be able to do that? <laughs> all right, so uh, we're going we're gonna to do a do as I say, not as I did before I was with Fiji. <laughs> um, in my younger years, as a very enthusiastic libertarian, uh, libertarian students at the University of Arizona I was involved in and you know had great opinions and I knew a lot and I knew how justice was and I was an honest person and I wanted everyone to know everything that I thought as many of us have are familiar with well I got called for jury duty and I was actually uh, one of the people who got questioned this was a case in which a defendant was being prosecuted for possession of some type of drugs and possession of drug paraphernalia. What is drug paraphernalia? In Arizona, it's basically anything that drugs touched. So he was essentially being prosecuted for possession of drugs and possession of a Ziploc bag. Now, even if you, even if you were against the legalization of drugs, you might be looking, looking at that you know, jail time for a Ziploc bag thing, a little bit of scans. So the question came up, uh, do you believe in legalization of drugs? And I said, yes, I do, <laughs> very proudly. And the question then was asked, which ones? And I said, all of them. <laughs> and there was kind of a gasp in the courtroom. And then after the, the judge recovered after a moment and was like, well, do you think that you could still be a fair judge in this case and you know, look at everything objectively and whatnot? And I thought to myself, I'm probably the only person here who would do that. <laughs> so I said, yes. I did expect to get kicked off the jury. I didn't expect to have to wait two hours until after lunch, but I was indeed excused. What could I have done better? <laughs> Uh, what I would have done differently today 
Um, if asked that question, you know, I might answer back with a question. Do you believe in legalizing drugs? Well, you mean like prescription drugs or what are you saying? You know, and I might play a little bit dumb. Um, I'm not gonna lie and say, no, I don't want no, get, you know, throw everyone in jail for drugs because you can be prosecuted for lying. But I'm not necessarily going to make it easy for the prosecutor to weed out my opinions. As it turns out, how juries are selected is basically they get rid of anyone who looks like they're educated, who looks like they have a strong opinion, who fits a profile that, of a person who would be a leader. And the jurors who are selected are the jurors who they know the least about. They're basically the wild cards. So I would suggest as a libertarian, when you go into the jury assembly room, don't wear your camo or your High Times t-shirt. Don't be carrying guns and ammo or your High Times magazine. Um, don't, if you have uh, tattoos or anything like that, cover them up if you can. Um, any interesting uh, jewelry or haircuts, anything that makes you stand out, tone it down as best you can. And during the jury selection process, you'll be asked questions to weed out your opinions. Don't volunteer information that is not asked for. Um, a lot of times I have people who even are well-meaning, you know, VJA advocates, but they feel like, oh, I'm being dishonest if I don't put forth information that was not asked of me. That is not correct. And in fact, the Laura Creho case was one where she was prosecuted for not volunteering information that the prosecutor would have wanted to know but didn't ask her about. And in that case, clearly established that that is not something that is her job, it is the prosecutor's job, or if the defense attorney wants to know something about you. It's their job, they're getting paid the big bucks, you're getting paid probably 25 bucks that day, tops. Um, you're not there to do their job for them. The other thing is, when you're asked a question, answer specifically what was asked. Don't expand it and interpret what is meant by that. Uh, there's a flyer that we have on our website um, that I recommend to people who are called for jury duty called Surviving War Deer. And that's written by Clay Conrad. And he gives kind of the example, um, you know, Let's say you're asked, you know, if this person is shown to have drugs, could you convict them? Well, yes, I could. Does that mean I'm going to? No, you're not making a commitment to convict anyone. You're simply stating that there is a theoretical possibility that that could happen. You could also chop off your arm. That doesn't mean you're going to. But if the question is, could you, there you go. You've specifically answered that question. You're not interpreting it. You're not adding in your own spin on it. You're simply fulfilling that question to the minimum requirement that you're to, to fulfill it. Um, so that's basically um, the, the, the way you get on a jury is to kind of go under the radar. <laughs> um, so that's kind of my recommendation there. Um, and then once you get on the jury, uh, I want to stress that jury duty for us is an inconvenience. Being convicted is life destroying. So maybe you're feeling rushed, you don't want to be there, uh, you have plans this weekend, you feel like you're getting behind at work, you really wanna wrap this up, please consider <laughs> that the person who's sitting at that other table could be you someday and please behave in the way that you would want your jurors to behave. I am always surprised by how many calls we get in the FIJA office, even sometimes from people who have been FIJA activists or FIJA supporters who thought, well, we are at an impasse. I couldn't flip the other people, so I changed my vote. There is a reason that we have in 48 states and the federal courts, a system that requires jury unanimity to convict. 
check our website maybe in a couple of weeks for a talk I gave last weekend at the Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences on those two outlying states that appallingly allow for non-unanimous convictions. I tell you that was a 20 minute talk in itself, so I won't get into that here. But the reason that we have jury unanimity is because even one person, if you believe that there is reasonable doubt, you know, your voice, this gives you the opportunity to stop an injustice yourself. Imagine, you know, if we're in San Antonio, imagine that the prosecutor is trying to make a case against them, someone, and goes through several dozen potential jurors and finally gets 12 that they like. And they can't convince 12 people out of the entire population of San Antonio that this person is not only guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, but should be convicted and punished in some way. What kind of, you know, how much lower of a standard can you get, really? 12 random people can't agree on that. Should we really be doing these things? Uh, that defendant is entitled to each of our own individual assessments. This is not a democratic situation. You'll notice that it's not a majority rule. When the uh, trial has concluded, we don't just independently vote, convict, and go home. This is a process that involves deliberation, wherein we interact with each other, we um, try to understand each other's points of view, other people may have seen something a different way. Uh, a great example of that is uh, there's actually evidence that uh, when you have a piece of evidence that the defendant was carrying a knife with them somewhere, white collar workers tend to think, oh, this person intended to do harm. Blue collar workers, as jurors, tend to think either that person may have needed it to protect themselves or they carry a knife because they use it in their job. That's not anyone being malicious, it's just that we all have different life experiences and different uh, ways and filters through which we view things. So this deliberative process lets us kind of, you know, toss these ideas around at each other and kind of understand the bigger picture. Um, other jurors may remember something that we don't, or we might remember something that they don't. Um, so it is a process that is designed to protect the defendant. Uh, from unjust uh, prosecutions and unjust convictions. In any system, we're going to have to err. Uh, libertarians, I hope all are on board with erring on the side of liberty. <laughs> and that's specifically what is going on here. The courtroom is not meant to be a level playing field. It is supposed to be tilted in favor of non-conviction. Yet all of these uh, years since the inception of our legal system, we've just seen more and more erosions of that protection, and it's now tilting towards prosecution. It is now serving the exact opposite purpose for which it was intended. Um, so I hope that all of these things are things you'll keep in mind. I hope that when you get a notice rudely telling you that you're required to show up for jury duty at a time that's totally inconvenient, <laughs> You will um, suppress the natural urge to throw it out, uh, to say, no, you can't make me, and understand that there's a bigger picture um, in which we may, we may not like how this, this opportunity was presented to us, but I hope that we do embrace it as an opportunity. And so I think we have just a few minutes left, and I thought I'd leave some time for questions if anyone has some. Sure. So I, I'm a, I'm a Let me give you the mic for that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm guessing that the, the camera can't pick up that, uh, that volume. Uh, so a couple of years ago, uh, a lot of people probably heard the story. I was arrested while hiking with my son, legally carrying a rifle. Uh, it was contempt of cop. The cop tried to take my firearm. Long story short, I was arrested for resisting arrest, went to trial challenged or challenged the constitutionality of the arrest. They kept changing the charges until they found interference. So went to a, uh, went to a court and ultimately I was convicted. And the point that I wanted to make was, uh, and this was a class B misdemeanor of interference. One of the jurors found me later, a couple of weeks later, 
and said, and just apologized. Because he said, with the jury instructions we were given, we were told we have no choice. And so had they been educated on their role, that you didn't have to do that. You know, there's only six there. Uh, so that's that's my, my comment. This this does happen, and I'm here I am three years now fighting, uh, having never broken a law in my life, I'm still fighting this court battle. My question to you is, I fight my own traffic tickets, and I always ask for a jury trial, and I'm usually pretty successful. Um, what do I, as a non-lawyer, what can I, when I'm doing the board hire, what do I tell these jurors when they're selected? I'm gonna, I'm gonna comment on your comment first because I don't have a quick and ready answer for the question. And I may, I may have to refer you elsewhere for that answer. Uh, but the jury instructions issue is a big problem. And I was asked recently by someone, you know, what kind of jury related thing or jury nullification related thing I can imagine going to the Supreme Court. And that is exactly one of them. Um, at the end of, I wanna say the end of 20, 14 or 2013, the Kansas State Supreme Court actually overturned a conviction based in part on jury instructions that so strongly implied that there is a, any sort of requirement to convict that a reasonable person would have felt like, oh, I have no other option. And that's very common. Uh, Dr. Roger Roots, one of our Board of Advisors members, points out that it used to be jury instructions said, uh, if you believe that the prosecution has failed to make its case beyond a reasonable doubt, you must acquit. If you believe the case has been made beyond a reasonable doubt, you should convict. And that must-should dichotomy was what was supposed to clue in <laughs> jurors that they had the right to nullify without kind of spelling it out to them in those exact words. But more and more we've seen that these, uh, the, the wording is now you must uh, or will convict, and that's simply not true. The, one of the most fundamental principles of our legal system is that jurors can't be punished for their verdicts, and that there is not, no permissibility of a directed verdict of guilty. Judges can, in certain circumstances, direct a not guilty verdict, but you can never direct a guilty verdict. Um, I think I am just going to uh, refer you probably to probably to our website, um, and I'm going to kind of put a deferred <laughs> deference on that. One of the things we've been trying to do, we have a lot of continuing legal education courses that Fiji used to do back in the 1990s that cover topics like that, and uh, I have a bunch of. Uh, VHS tapes and tape cassettes out in storage <laughs> that are probably pretty fragile after being thermal cycled through Montana winters. <laughs> um, but we're trying to get that all digitized. And so um, I would say probably in the next couple of months, start looking in the library of our website. That's not something that I in particular am a, an expert on that I would not feel comfortable discussing, like giving, giving you comments on that. Um, I don't want to steer anything wrong, um, but please stay after so I can chat with you a little bit about your case. <laughs> um, any, any other questions? All right, well, let me take a quick poll to wrap this up. Who here um, actually wants to be on jury duty? I never get called. Yeah, yeah it's tough to get called. <laughs> That, that's one of the one of the interesting things about jury duty is prosecutors make a living of this. They write the script. We're all amateurs by definition. When we go to jury duty, we've almost never done it before, and if we have done it before, we've done it only once. So it's it can be very confusing, especially in, in a case such as this, where it's like, well, the judge sounds very intimidating, and we we're like, well. We can't do any outside research to tell if what he's telling us is true. And you know, you kind of feel like you're being funneled into a certain direction, regardless of whether or not that's justice. But the ultimate point of the whole legal system, and I should say the ostensible point of the legal system, <laughs> is to uphold justice. It is, it is the law that is to uphold justice. It is not that justice is to bend 
to fulfill the arbitrary dictates of you know, corrupt laws. So thank you very much all for your time. Um, I hope that you learned something. And before you go, I hope you'll come up to the front. I have some brochures. The one person who is guaranteed never to be on your jury is you. So the fact that you stand in here today will be of no help to you if you run afoul of the law or are maliciously prosecuted. So what I hope each of you will do is take 12 brochures with you and go out and create your own fully informed jury so that if you ever need them, you will have access to fully informed jurors. Thank you.